of, of where we are and the things that affect us. And um, we, we kind of selected that topic because that's the, the, the burning issue now, and it's really rest on top of all the things that Dr. Wilson have been talking about. You know, so um, he's got two new books out, and we had just got them in, and um, I don't even recall, they're so fresh, the, the names of, of the two of them, but there's two new books added to Black on Black Violence and the uh, Psychological Development of Black Child, and I understand that, um, Dr. Will, you're working on another piece that the sister was telling me the other day that another book is on the way out. So, um, I mean, that's, that's good to hear that, to, that you, you, you're producing, you know, uh, the works for us. But without any further delay, let's put our hands to, uh, together and welcome Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's indeed a pleasure to be invited to spend this time again here with you today. I appreciate your coming out on uh, a holiday like this, and on a day like this. And of course, I want to wish all of the fathers and parents Happy Father's Day. I want to also thank you for uh, patronizing the publications that were mentioned and asking, I'm asking you to look forward to a number of others. Uh, the response to black on black violence has been very good. And I see the awakening, the natural genius of black children has taken off very well. Those of you who are familiar with the developmental psychology of the black child, we we'll saw to see that awakening the natural genius of black children is a related publication. And it's not an accidental name, of course, because for those of you who read the developmental psychology of the black child, you certainly have recognized that our children have a natural genius. Our children have a natural head. You will note in that book, which is very short, less, uh, there's less psychological jargon than black on black, so perhaps you'll have less of a time. <laughs> it might help sometimes if you would uh, read this one and go back, even though I do encourage you to stick with black on black, though. Uh, the outline there is, is, if you give it a little time and meditate with it, you'll find that it's, it's not uh, difficult to crack. Because essentially, as the title implies, what we're dealing here is with is how our people are motivated by white domination to destroy themselves. And so we're dealing here with the psychology of self-destruction as, as motivated and created by a ruling group. So I think what catches a lot of people is the approach. We're so, we're so used to sort of looking at so-called crime and criminality as a result of broken homes, as a result of drugs in the neighborhood, the presence of weapons in the neighborhood, the absence of employment, and so forth. And while these things contribute to violence and contribute to criminality in the community, I do not see them as the primary causes and to a good extent, you can take your hint from the fact that if these causes are trotted out in the media, that it is, if it's standard talk in the media shows to talk about the black family as the cause of, of problems with our children, or unemployment as a, a chief cause of crime, or drugs, the very fact that the ruling establishment projects those explanations should make you suspicious, okay? Because the main function of their explanations is to deny their own role in the situation and is to obscure the real and true causes. 
they will invariably talk about secondary causes, you see. The so-called broken black family, the so-called crisis in the black family is not a cause, it's an effect, you see. The presence of drugs and guns are also effects. The presence, the presence of unemployment is also an effect. Miseducation, also effect. And when you start looking at those as primary causes, you're going to almost invariably go wrong. Because all of these result from one major thing, and that is the fact that black men are still permitting white men to run this world. And that black men have not decided yet fully to bring an end to the rulership of this world by white men. And, and until that happens, you are going to get violence at various levels in the community. So black on black deals with that. Essentially, it is dealing with white on black violence, you see and moved from, from that. And the, and the psychology of it is, is that this violence is hidden often or denied. It also deals with the fact that the European man and the white man is the most criminal man the earth has ever seen. The most murderous group of people the world has ever known who run this world based on terror, murder, and criminality. The interesting thing is many people see them as symbols of sanity. <laughs> and many of us want our children to be just like theirs. And all of this kind of thing. And that's, that's, that's interesting. It's a very interesting situation. And so we, we got to look at that psychology. And so to a great extent, we see here a system designed to create this image that goes directly against the obvious history of these people, where the victims themselves see their major goal as that, as one of intermixing with these murderers and see the highest point of their lives as that of living among these people. That's, that's, it's, and so it gets a little complicated, but it's important that you understand this kind of system. Because as I point out a little more clearly, I think, in understanding black male adolescent violence, you see, that the major point here is that these people try to hide that criminality. And the whole of the system is built around denial of criminality. And the major method then of denial of their criminality is projection. To accuse others of being criminal. And that's the essence of what we're talking about. That's why in the first section you see the reference to projection, you see, and denial. When you look at these people as having a collective ego and their major wish is to maintain their image of being morally superior, you see, in spite of their record, in spite of the fact that this is a criminal nation, this is a criminal government, this is one organized mafia unit called the United States, that this nation is founded on two major crimes, the rape and robbery and murder of the Native American and the theft of their lands, and of course, upon the enslavement and death of our own people. No constitution, no set of laws, no beautiful preamble will cover the stench of those original sins. 
and they will still be at the center and heart of this nation. I don't care how you try to cover it up uh, in the name of democracy and these other kind of things. And there has been no other ethnic group that has created this kind of record. And yet, as I said earlier, this group has managed to make itself appear to be superior and has managed to try to even lecture other groups and people about their moral behavior. But of course, if you wish to hide your criminality, then a good method and technique is to holler criminal, criminal, criminal out loud and point the finger at someone else. This is what we call this is what we call projection. As Clinton Cox indicated, the white man calls the Indian a savage so that he could justify treating him savagely. <laughs> and that's that's the way the ball game plays. And this is the essence of projection, you see. It provides an excuse, it provides an image and a rationale, and it removes the onus from the true perpetrator onto the victim. And so the Indian is a savage, and now this allows us to deal with him savagely, to rob and kill him and take his lands. The African is a criminal, therefore we can treat him criminally. And this is the other part of the equation. And that means then, since they are savages and they are criminals, we are clean. That's what projection is about, and that's what Black on Black is talking about, you see, in his very first chapters. It follows that up by saying then, when you combine projection with power, then you have a vehicle for creation and bringing into reality what may at first was a false accusation. At first you accuse the other of being a criminal. But if you have the power to create the conditions, you see, certain conditions, if you have the power such that that person reacts incorrectly to your accusation, if you have the power such that the only information they get about themselves is the information that you give them, then projection becomes a creative process and actual criminality begins to occur. And this is again what we're getting at about in Black on Black, you see. The creation, the accusation, the creation of the conditions, and now a certain segment of that population comes into reality, and now you run out to the jails and the prisons and you count noses. And then you start making statistical statements. You're only 15% of the population, but you're nearly 50% of the jails. We now therefore justify in our original conception of you. <laughs> you see? And, uh, and this is what we, this is this in essence what we're talking about in black and black. The accusation process, the combining of accusation with power and creating of certain conditions, the reaction by those accused and projected on such, in such ways that some of them will engage in behavior that we label as criminal, and the use then of that behavior and the use of the results of that behavior to try to substantiate the original accusation itself. The other part of that book, of course, deals with the fact that all too often the victim being cut off from independent sources of information, the victim somehow coming to believe 
in the moral superiority of the one that dominates him, in the authority of the one that dominates him, often then internalizes the attitudes projected by his dominator. And he becomes possessed by those attitudes because those attitudes take life in his body and in his mind and he identifies with those attitudes. And in that sense then, he begins to look at his fellow victims through the eyes of those that dominate him and he becomes cut off from them and alienated from them and sees them as the enemy, as the ones to be exploited and therefore engages often in violence against his own people and violence against himself. So I think we have here a relatively straightforward and simple proposition. And I think if you hang in with uh, Black on Black, and uh, you'll be able to see, see what we're getting at there. To a good extent, what Sister Soldier is alluding to out here, of course, is premised in the very introduction of Black on Black violence. And it, there, it, there are references to it throughout. Why not victimize the victimizer? The very first introduction talks about the issue of powerlessness and what powerlessness, how powerlessness motivates often many of us to attack our own people. The very essence of what she's alluding to is the section where we deal with displaced aggression, where the source of the aggression and the cause of the aggression is not rooted out or attacked for a number of reasons. And the victim of that aggression reacting with frustration and anger and confused about the source of his frustration and anger or fearful to confront the sources of his frustration and anger attacks fellow victims. And in a sense, he kills himself and kills his fellows because he has not yet made up his mind to kill white men. Black men will end their killing of each other the day they decide to kill white men. And I mean that metaphorically and if necessarily literally on both levels. Otherwise, you will be displacing your aggression and attacking the wrong targets. And in that sense, you become an ally to your dominator. And you join when with him to destroy your own. The, we do have some upcoming publications. I will, in the fall, we'll be doing Educating the Black Child for the Black Children, the African Children for the 21st Century. So we want you to look out for that. We are going to look at a rationale for an Afrocentric and African-centered education. We will explore it on a number of levels not just in the sense of where a knowledge of African history and culture is missing from the curriculums, from the curricula of this country and across the world, but look at it from the point of view of what is the ultimate purpose for an African-centered education. Where are we going with it? Recognizing the fact that the major purpose of education is not merely lifting the self-esteem of our young people and not merely getting them to read and to write better, those things, but the ultimate function of education 
is to protect the very biological survival of a people. And ultimately, the quality of education must be measured against its capacity to maintain a people's survival. Because learning to read and write well and learning uh, skills and so forth is pointless if you cannot defend your very lives, if you cannot stay alive in the world. And the lives of African people are in serious danger today. We are under serious threat. No amount of learning of skills, mathematical, computational, computer skills, engineering skills, and so forth, by themselves are going to guarantee this without a sense of nation and without an overarching purpose. And that purpose is that of liberation, independence, and the capacity to protect both once one gets them. And education then begins not with what the children are missing in school and not with what they are not getting in school, but it begins with the question of what are the major problems that our people must solve as people, you see. And then you follow it up with the question of what kind of people must we produce in order to solve these problems? What kind of institutions must be developed? What kind of social relations and ideologies must be developed in order for us to secure our biological survival and to secure our liberation, independence, and our capacity to protect all of these things. And you work from that because it's these overarching problems and overarching issues that lays the basis and foundation for curriculum. You see, when you ask what kind of people what kind of institutions? Then you follow that up then about then what kind of learning experiences should our children and our people undergo in order that they can de concretely develop these institutions and social relations. So it's not a matter of just learning efficiency and putting knowledge and skills in people's head. Mm -mm. That knowledge, the knowledge and skills have to be correlated and coordinated with overall goals and purposes. And after you get through then looking at the kinds of experiences, you want to match those up with the developmental psychology of your children, which, as you know, is not a psychology of other people's children, you see. And you've got to know that. You got to know that your, the, the maturation of our children differs significantly from that of white children. We know that the psychology of a people reflects their history and experience, and the history and experience of African people is not that of European people, and therefore the psychology cannot be that of those people, and therefore the psychology, which is the foundation of learning and teaching, cannot be the same as that of those people. And therefore, it means we have to develop a new pedagogy, a pedagogy, a, an approach to teaching and instruction that is in line with the psychology of our people and the psychology of our children. Not one that's borrowed, not one that's begged, but one that is developed, one that is organically and intrinsically related to our knowledge of ourselves and the knowledge of our history. The experience of African American people in America and in the world in general has been such that our approaches and styles of learning are significantly different from those of white children. And therefore, an African-centered education is not only then a theory that deals with the inclusion of content into the curriculum, 
but it is a theory, it involves in its fullest extent a theory of learning as well as theories of teaching. And so we then hoped in the fall, and we, we, we don't hope it will be present in the fall because we've, made, we've completed the, the manuscript, we're just editing it. So we will have this available so that we can combine learning theory, teaching theory, with social, political theory, ideology, and purpose. I will mention another current series that I'm working on, and that's our power series that you'll be hearing about, a series of 10 lectures that we'll be doing in the fall, built around the issue of power and how to get it, how to keep it, and how to apply it in a very direct way. We're going to now look for a moment at the subject matter of our lecture revolt, riot, or revolt, an urban analysis. The subject matter is an interesting one and raises some interesting questions and implications, riot or revolt. Sometimes you have to start off in analyzing things in terms of why the question itself. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get off, and I see some of us on TV, it, we're so quick to try to answer the question, we don't question the question. Except, <laughs> why are you asking? <laughs> what difference is the answer going to make? And often the question implies options depending on the answer. What would be the response if I were to call the Los Angeles disturbances riots instead of revolts? It's an important question there. And in a sense, we're asking and, and, and making this question because we understand implicitly that when one sees it as a riot or sees it as revolt, it implies different kinds of responses, different kinds of approaches. Because even though riot and revolt are not as cleanly delineated or defined as we would like to think, they do, and they overlap a great deal they do also have some differences in implication that become important. Because often people see at essence, in its essence, a riot as being fundamentally irrational, fundamentally having little or no real rational purpose, an expression of rage, frenzy, as indicative of people who have lost self-control and self-direction, as indicative of some type of psychological contagion where people lose their ethical and moral values and are swept away by the emotions of the moment or by rumor or by agitators who happen to take advantage of their lack of self-control and who become, for the moment perhaps, their egos and direct them in various ways. They, often the word riot implies to a certain degree in certain circumstances a shifting leadership or an absence of leadership, or what we might call plural leadership, where you have a number of power centers and people and groups are kind of just moving off on their own for their own reasons, except that they, the only thing they have in common is a will to destroy and to, to be violent. 
revolt, even though it re, a, re, a riot can be a form of revolt, but revolt sort of implies a renunciation of allegiance to authority, a refusal to go along anymore, whereas one went along in the past. As a statement about the legitimacy of authority, a revolt is a form of accusation that one lays against authority. It's a form of condemnation, accusing those in authority of breach of contract, a violation of the social contract, moving beyond an understood mandate. A revolt is an act of refusal. And it is not only, though, a form of negation where one refuses, but also, in another way, an act of affirmation by the person who's refusing or by the people who are defying authority. Who It means that they are often making a statement about themselves and about their humanity. And they're making statements about morality and about the fact that they perceive the authorities as having engaged in immoral and unwarranted behavior. So in that regard, it becomes important to distinguish between the two. Even though there is a question as whether these distinctions will make much of a difference after all, because from the point of view of those in authority, the tendency will be to call a revolt a riot. Because you see, for the authorities to admit that it's a revolt, to a degree implies that they must begin to question the legitimacy of their authority. They must begin to examine whether they have actually breached a contract. They may be forced to give those that accuse them some credibility. And they may be forced to face the possibility that the revolt is justified on a number of of uh, bases. They may be forced to recognize that those in revolt are real human beings and have humanity. And they may then have to face the fact that they truly may be wrong and immoral in what they're doing. That's asking a lot of people who are in control of society. And you can see why then they almost irresistibly will define any protest, legitimate or otherwise, in terms of riotous behavior. Because one of the things that the authorities tend to do, of course, is to defend their own collective egos, as we talked about in Black on Black Marriage, you see. To justify their own behavior, to try to maintain their own sense of superiority. They defend themselves against the possibility that, that if they admit even a bit that they are wrong or that their behavior is immoral, that the foundations on which their domination is built may begin to crumble. So consequently then, from the authoritarian point of view, it becomes more advantageous for them to define our behavior, no matter how legitimate, no matter how much the accusation of our, no matter how much our behavior 
is justified by circumstances to call that behavior riotous because it helps them to maintain their own self-image. And so in the light of this, a long debate in terms of riot or revolt from our point of view is probably not worth the energy because those that run the society will insist on seeing it as riotous behavior. Perhaps we need to convince some of us of, this, of the fact that we are not talking about riotous behavior. But from the point of view of those that run the society, it is pointless. As long as we are sure that our behavior represents a statement about our condition and about our humanity, then that is all we need to push forward to achieve our goals. One of the other things that worries people about the disturbances in LA and other similar ones is the nature of violence. And yet we have to face the fact that violence is often what we call the handmaiden of revolutions, insurrections, revolt. And I hear some people I hear now condemning violence in a wholesale manner. I'm against all forms of violence. <laughs> well, you can be against it, but that's not going to change the reality of it. And that violence has been with us a long time and it's going to be with us for a while yet. And trying to deny it and make pious statements against it is not going to solve the issue and solve the problem. Ultimately, we must confront the role of violence and what it is and, how, and what role it plays in mankind. Violence is common to many revolutions because after all, changes are being sought by extra legal means. Time and the normal channel of political influence are being short-circuited. We have some people here who think that we can have strong, deep, and significant political revolutions within the legal confines of society itself. There is no legal revolution. There is no legal revolt, you see. The very essence of revolution itself is illegal or extra legal. And violence is a form of political influence. And it is a means of exerting political influence and violence, particularly within a system of this type, is itself revolutionary because the traditional and so-called legitimate means, which exclude non-governmental violence, are not only rejected, but are reversed. What are we saying here? We're saying here there are some people who try to advise us to use the system and to stay within the system. This is not a system without violence. Of course, as I indicated to you earlier, this is a system born and bred in violence. Government is not nonviolent, violent, and the system is not nonviolent. Government is a monopoly on violence. And to a great extent, you see, Behind the rules of the system lies the iron fist of the government. And to a great extent, the essence of government is its monopoly on violence. And it wishes then to be the only party in a political conference that has violence as an instrument of enforcement. And it tells everyone else then that they should not use 
this instrument and should follow then the system. But of course the issue becomes what happens if the system does not work? And what happens if the traditional rules do not work? And one of the things we have to keep in mind, of course, is that when you have power, that power confers upon you the capacity to create rules in such a way that the power is not challenged as long as people follow the rules. As a matter of fact, one of the first things you want to do is to establish rules such that the power of the authority in the government cannot be challenged through following them. And that means then that the government can even use its own rules as instruments of terror and instruments of violence, as instruments of uh, maintaining oppression and yet it seeks to deny its own population the instruments it uses to crush that population to defend itself against being crushed and against the hostility of government. Therefore, when the people use violence, they are engaging in an act of revolt and in a revolutionary act in that they are stepping outside of the rules and confronting the government and confronting authorities with extra legal, illegal means of bringing about change and of influencing that government itself. Mob violence, though it may not be the result of deliberate thought, though it may not appear to be so, the vehicle for the promulgation of ideologically based revolutionary programs and may be in part the momentary seemingly trivial decision may seem to be influenced by momentary seemingly trivial decisions made by any number of individuals in an environment of chaos and disorganization may nevertheless forecast revolution. So even if you call the disturbance in LA and other cities riots, does not mean that these do not, on some level, forecast revolutionary change. Of course, they may be indicative of a revolution which is already occurring. Or finally, they may indicate the need for revolution. Therefore, we have to look at them no matter how disorderly they may appear, no matter how self-destructive they may appear, no matter how superficially irrational they may appear to be, they still can be indicators of the state of the nation and be indicators of needs in societies that must be met. As a means of exerting political influence or as a reaction to provocative political and economic circumstances, violence is a form of terror. People are horrified by so-called riotous behavior or revolts and the violence that attends them. But terror is not without purpose and not without place. As terror It emanates an atmosphere of fear and despair. Fear and despair generally accompanied by seemingly senseless and wanton threats to life and property carried out in ways that appear to be lawless or norm uh, normless. Behavior that is not motivated and carried out in terms of definite mores and values. However, we should be reminded where legitimated and traditionally nonviolent means of influence in government, of righting perceived and real injustices, of satisfying grievances and complaints by aggrieved parties, 
are of no avail or where government has failed to keep its mandates and actually has expressed hostility toward its subjects or a, an important segment of its subject population. In this instance, then, the habits of obedience may be dissolved and terror in the form of violence instigated. Those of you who have reviewed Rousseau, for instance, or other writers, recognize the fact that the people in a nation do not exist merely to be ruled and merely to be controlled by government or merely to have rules and laws imposed upon them. The government ultimately is a creation of the people. And the government enter, in, enters into a contractual relationship with the people. And at the foundation of the relationship between a people and its government is that of reciprocity, that of give and take, that we permit the government certain powers and certain liberties and prerogatives in return for certain services that it will provide to the people. It is not there to rule and dominate the people, but to serve the people. And as long as it then is meeting the demands of its mandate, we then will obey its demands. But when government violates the reciprocity, when government does not hold up its end of the contract, then people begin to question whether they are any longer obligated to obey its rulings and to pledge allegiance to that government. And this is the thing that we face today in this country. Under such circumstances, terror becomes the last resort the logically natural instrument of influence because of its wholesale effectiveness. Where else can you go? What else can you do? What else can you do after going to the Supreme Court and being turned down, after marching day after day, time after time, after trying to get civil rights laws passed and other kinds of laws passed? going to the Democratic conventions, going to the Republican conventions, writing the state of black America year after year, and rewriting the same story over and over again, trying to vote, trying to do this, trying to do that, getting agreements that the government blatantly disregards or reverses at some point later. What else is left? What happens when government no longer listens and no longer hears the cries and the pleas of its people? How then can you get them to hear? This is ultimately implicitly or explicitly what a people who engage in revolt. These are the, this is the question that they ask themselves. And therefore, a revolt, even though it may not be conscious, has an unconscious rationality about it. And it is of great value. When I talk about power this fall, I will talk about the fact, as I will mention here later, that social disruption are weak people's mightiest weapon against the government. And in no way should they be dissuaded to not use it when necessary. Quoting from the politics of violence and revolution in the modern world, Leiden and Smith, terror is an atmosphere of despair. 
What value can such an atmosphere have? Some people will ask. The answer lies for both those who agitate and those who defend in the effects that this atmosphere has on the mass and on the elite. Effects not readily attainable by ordinary means of persuasion or coercion. There are things that cannot be accompanied and accomplished within the system by the rules of the system, only by some extraordinary, extra legal, extra normal process can they be effectuated. The creation of an attitude of despair breaks down the resistance of those who need to be persuaded. They are to be so shocked and numbed, so weakened and demoralized, so pessimistic of hope that they become amenable to anything that promises release from tension. That's why we bring in violence in the process, because it gets results, and it gets them fast, and it creates a major impression on people. Look at that passing of the so-called billion dollar handout to the U.S. Senate the other day. And look at the certain concern with the cities of uh, this country, a concern that was not there prior to violence, a concern that was not there, as I said earlier, with volume upon volume of the states of black America, a concern that was not there as a result of Jesse Jackson running one campaign after another to bring those concerns before the American public and before the American government. Concerns that were not there as a result of marches and rallies and protests and all of the other acceptable and traditional approaches that we have used in the society. A president who was known for his vetoing of anything that had to do with the uplift of African people in America now his attention is focused for a moment. If he does not want violence to become a way of life for our getting his attention, then he should not wait to reward violence with his attention. The creation then of an atmosphere of despair speaks both to those in power and those out of power the ultimate and the most potent political economic weapons of the poor and the weak are social disruption. No business as usual. Violent, both violent and nonviolent, and terroristic violence. Generally, the use of these weapons are utilized by the desperate, by those whose hopes and expectations have been inexplicably or shamefully dashed, those to whom reasonable and just promises have been made but have been revoked, reneged on, or broken without apparent good reasons or for apparently malicious reasons. This is why even at the time when a group of people appear to be improving, as some would remind us, now we have this black, big black middle class growing and there is, things are much better than others, other times, you are now be engaging in this behavior. However, there are still promises which have remained unkept. There are still contracts being violated, and there's still the malicious movement of those in government against our people. And there are still the reversals of these so-called gains perpetrated by those in power. In such situation, the commitment to mob insurrectionary, violent, reactionary activities seem to reflect natural and inevitable responses. Terror is a weapon or social instrumentality naturally suited to the struggles of peoples and groups without effective, organized power bases. What other mean do you have 
I can see these snobbish people with their power and with their influence, with their false sense of moral superiority, trying to persuade the poor and the weak not to use the only weapon they have left, <laughs> violence and disruption, hiding behind pieties and religious and moral bromides. It's a good thing that the poor see through it. It's amazing that the poor and the weak wait so long to bring about change by the only means they have available to them. We cannot assume, however, that terror revolts and the like are always deliberately planned, deliberately instigated, or predictable events which eventuate into predictable outcomes. Many times they are apparently spontaneous, utterly without intention, and may abort or disappear without apparent reason. However, the, this view of seeing insurrections, of seeing revolts as being spontaneous, as being without intention, reflects a failure on the part of those who view them this way to distinguish between immediate precipitant causes of violence and preconditional and underlying circumstances which makes it possible for the precipitant to produce violence. What are we saying here? When people discuss the issues in LA, they want to discuss them only within the context of the time that these disturbances occurred. And they only want to discuss them in terms of the images of people running around in the street and destroying property within that context. And one of the things that the ruling groups in this society always seeks to do is to control time control the use of time. And by confining then the discussion to the period of time of the disturbance, then the emphasis is on the actual behavior. And therefore the behavior is not placed within historical context, political and ideological context and therefore is made to appear all the more irrational and purposeless. Often the events that precipitate a so-called riot or a so-called revolt appears to be somewhat minor, you see, and in and of itself not worthy of the kind of reaction that occurred. But this can only appear to be the case when one ignores the prior history of the disturbance. And one ignores the underlying emotional state, social and political and economic conditions that existed at the time of the disturbance. When one forgets then that the apparently minor occasion which precipitated the reactionary disturbance itself may have been symbolic of a particular set of historical circumstances and symbolic of a particular state of mind. Merely the straw that breaks the camel's back. Because as we say in black on black violence, every act has a history. And it's in that history that we come to understand it. And therefore, we must resist the attempts of those on TV who interview us and so forth to confine the discussion to the mere behavior of the people during the time that that behavior occurred. And we ourselves must look at the history that occurred prior to the, the event and more importantly, at the state of mind of the people who precipitated the event or were precipitated by events 
to engage in that behavior. The preconditions which set the stage, which set the stage for the Los Angeles and urban revolts have a long history and are many. They include both socioeconomic conditions and the collective mental state of the African American community. Of the two, the mental state of anxiety and frustration over current and future developments, that state is the more important. It's not the, the concrete state as much as the perception of the state and the state of mind of a people. The dissatisfied state of mind and the attitude the black people toward our conditions constitute the major factors which precede and underlie urban violence and revolt. So you can't look at the number of people who have achieved middle class status and so forth. You must look at the state of mind of our people and the level of dissatisfactions that exist in our minds as people. The preconditions for the L.A. revolt, of course, were many. And I'll just name a few of them. We don't have time to go through them all. Some of you might have had a chance to see or read the Atlantic magazine of May 1991. And you see here, of course, the issue of race was its cover story. When, when the official subject is presidential politics, taxes, welfare, crime, rights, or values, the real subject is race. We have old quail who can't tell the difference between potato and potato <laughs> talking about traditional values. Another coded word for race, implying that black folk have no values, implying somehow that black mothers and fathers actually tell their children to go out and commit crime. Son, when I want you to grow up, I want you to be the biggest crack dealer on the block. That would just make me so happy. Be a criminal. Drop out of school. You know, what, 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 what is this man talking about? What is he implying when he tries to imply that there's an absence of so-called values in the black community? Be very suspicious, by the way, of these people who talk about values anyway. We have to ask him, what kind of values did they have to make them rob and steal and destroy the Indians and the enslavement of black people? As I often said about Jimmy Swaggart when he used to talk about that old time religion. He used to march across that stage with that Bible pumping up and down. Yes, talking about the religion of his great grandpas and how he wanted that religion brought back. And of course, I have to remind my people, you really don't want that religion brought back. Because at the time they had that religion, they were hanging and lynching black people and enslaving black people. So I definitely don't want that old time religion. And I'm a little weary about those traditional values he's talking about too. Because those are the, apparently the values that underlie the racism of this nation and that rationalizes white supremacy and that somehow lays the ideological foundations for the mistreatment of African people in America. I am not concerned then about the restoration of their so-called traditional values, but the creation of new values. In this book and in this, in this magazine by Thomas Byrne Edsall and Mary Edsall, they start out the article by stating race is no longer a straightforward, morally unambiguous force in American politics. 
Instead, considerations of race are now deeply embedded in the strategy and tactics of politics. In competing concepts of the function and responsibility of government, and in every voter's conceptual structure of moral and partisan identity. So we're at the very center and heart of how America defines itself. Race helps define the liberal and conservative ideologies, shapes the presidential coalitions of the Democratic and Republican parties, provides a harsh new dimension to concern over taxes and crime, drives a wedge through alliances of the working classes and the poor, and gives both momentum and vitality to the drive to establish a national majority inclined by income and demography to support policies benefiting the affluent and upper middle class. In terms of policy, race has played a critical role in the creation of a political system that has tolerated, if not supported, the growth of the disparity between rich and poor over the past 15 years. Race-coded images and language changed the course of the 1980, 1984, and 1988 presidential elections and the 1990 elections for the governorships of California and Alabama, the U.S. Senate in North Carolina, and the post of Texas Secretary of Agriculture. The political role of race is subtle and complex, requiring listening to those whose views are deeply repellent to some and deeply resonant for others. The debate over racial policy has been skewed and distorted by a profound failure to listen. And so we see here then that blacks are the scapegoats of this society. African Americans are the means by which this society defines itself. As I say it again in black on black violence, you see, that the whole of the white ego and the whole of the white self-image is built on its definition of who black people and African people are. That is why it is obsessed by criminalizing African people. Whenever you see a people insisting against all kinds of evidence on negating and scandalizing the personality of another person or another people, you recognize then that they're engaged in those acts to protect their own ego and that their ego structure is built on maintaining the scandalizing of their targets. And that if they did not have these targets of scandal, if they did not have these egos, these, these people as scapegoats, their facade and their infrastructure would crumble and fall apart. They would come face to face with the madness and insanity that motivates their personalities and their systems. When blacks move out of our role as scapegoats and redefine ourselves in ways that cannot be denied by any people in the world, then white people will go crazy and they will fall apart. And we said in Black on Black then that the so-called criminality of black people is an economic and political necessity for maintaining the system. It is not merely an accusation flowing from racial prejudice nor merely accusation flowing from racial hatred, as hatred has little to do with it. It is necessary to the very foundations of the system itself. And that's why at the center of it, even in the current politics of today, you will see African people. 
and how will you deal with African people has a determining factor in terms of who will get elected and who will be given power in this society. It determines who will be called liberal and who will be called conservative. It determines then the support that they will win in this system or will not win. And we have a situation here then where the Democratic Party and the dastardly behavior of Clinton is trying to change its per the perception that the white electorate has of it so that it can gain power by disrespecting black people and by creating bogus issues. And again, it has come to recognize, as is made very clear in this article, which basically lays out a program for the Democratic Party for achieving power in America by saying you've got to learn somehow to disentangle yourself from these black folk. Because in an analysis that you sponsored, a polling firm that you hired found the following. These white Democratic defectors, talking about those, what you call the Reagan Democrats, <laughs> express a profound distaste for black a sentiment that pervades almost everything they think about government and politics. Blacks constitute the explanation for their white defectors' vulnerability and for almost everything that has gone wrong in their lives. Not being black is what constitutes being middle class. Not living with blacks is what makes a neighborhood a decent place to live. These sentiments have, been, have imparted implications for Democrats as virtually all progressive symbols and themes have been redefined in racial and pejorative terms. The special status of blacks is perceived by almost all of these individuals as a serious obstacle to their personal advancement. Indeed, discrimination against whites has become a well-assimilated and ready explanation for their status, vulnerability, and failures. So you see why we got to look at more than whether we've gotten an increase in jobs and whether <laughs> more of us are in schools and so forth because the attitudes that the other people are operating on have little or nothing to do with these, these, these sort of things. You read last week where the whites engaging in the buying of weapons is increasing at a faster rate than, than blacks. And whites engaging in violence is, is increasing 30% faster than blacks. And as I will talk a bit later on, this speaks to the fact that whites feel extremely vulnerable. They feel under threat. And this implies then that at some point, these feelings may boil over into attacks on the black community. For the rationales have already been set. This then, this situation where the election to political office, where gaining the reins of power depends upon one's relationship and attitude toward blacks, it's very serious. It means then that blacks must be subjected to a constant barrage of innuendo and scandal. And that the best way to get over then is by attacking the very integrity and humanity of the black community. And it means then that this attack on the humanity and the integrity of the black community must proceed even at the time when some blacks appear to be making it up in the system. It means that you must even use those blacks who are making it up in the system to join you in the attack on themselves. This, this is one of the underlying causes. This 
is one of the preconditions that was there when the, the L.A. insurrection occurred. If you read the current mag Atlantic magazine, which seems to revel in the analysis of African people, they will talk in this current month about the suburban century. They call it the suburban century begins. And what do they mean by that? They're referring to the fact now that the political base of this country lies in the suburban areas. And for the first time in the history of this country, it's the suburbs who carry the weight in terms of votes. It is no longer the large cities uh, which carry the larger percentage of voters. And consequently then, politicians who expect to get elected to office must speak to the suburbs and must cajole those and flatter those who live there. This is why then you're hearing again and again about this neglected middle class, you see, and programs that concern themselves with rehabilitating and restoring the middle class. Another code for we are going to ignore these blacks whom we have locked into these inner cities. And we are not now going to propose any kind of programs for them. We are now going to propose that you are the ones that are in trouble. And we now are going to rescue you from your troubles. You'll look in many of the publications today talking about edge cities. New cities created by, principally by whites that ring the inner cities. Cities that now, whose governments are in, almost under direct control of these white suburbanites. Cities then that have influence in state governments in such a way that they can prevent taxation schemes that are meant to rescue the inner cities, that are meant to change the direction of the miseducation of our children, that are meant to relieve the problems of the inner cities. We have a situation then where whites have organized themselves in such a way that a politician who even talks about the rescue of the cities is literally damned for state office or for higher office. And now you see Clinton and other groups speaking to this suburban fringe. Is this fringe suffering? They tend to think that the black community implicitly or explicitly is not aware of what is going on. Let's look at some of these things, some of these preconditions. By 1991, the federal government's largest housing subsidy program was providing an average of $3,000 a year for each of 6 million wealthiest households in America, while offering nothing to the 36 million Americans in poverty. Only one of every eight federal benefit dollars actually reaches Americans in poverty. There has been a wholesale rape and robbery of the poor and weak in this country. And yet, this is the class that is supposedly now being rescued and is now supposedly uh, being uh, ministered unto by those who run for office. From 1981, from 1980 to 1991, in constant dollars, the average federal benefit received by households with incomes under $10,000 declined by 7%. An actual decrease in benefits from the government, but yet we get a lying and deceptive image that because of the fiscal difficulties in this country of those people on welfare, of the burden placed upon the government and upon the treasury by the poor people and by inner city people. And yet these people earning under 10,000 have actually had their monies taken away and not added on to. While the rich and while the middle class have actually uh, fed at the government troughs. On average, 
households with incomes under $10,000 collected a total of $5,690 in benefits. On average, households with incomes over $100,000 collected $9,280 from the government. In other words, those making over $100,000 collect nearly twice as much from the government as those earning under 10. You see, you'll hear whites in making these discussions and, and talking about the state of this country and talking about the debt that this country is suffering from. And you can hear them talk about the deficit and the threat that this deficit holds for the health of this nation. And I want to warn you that this nation is in a very precarious state of circumstances. And the precariousness of its state will be made clear after the elections. But if you listen carefully, you can already feel the panic over the concerns of the, the economic state of this country. They are in such a panic that they know they have to reduce the deficit of this nation if it is to survive and if it is going to be socially viable. In my series on power, I talk about one of the causes of black on black violence, other than the psychology that I referred to earlier, other than the social relations, has to do with the economic state of the black community. I try to emphasize that it's very important from a conceptual point of view to think in terms of a nation within a nation when it comes to analyzing black problems. I am not advocating that you buy the concept that we should have a nation within a nation. So don't give me a knee-jerk reaction right on. What I am saying is just think conceptually in terms of black people as a nation within a nation. I think when you use this concept, it will help you to see some things that perhaps you cannot see through the use of other concepts, such as individualism and the other stuff that people lay on you. When you look at the black community in the African-American community in this country, as a nation within a nation, it come, becomes almost immediately apparent as to why there's so much violence and social disorganization in the black community. I often use the Chinese opium wars to illustrate what I'm talking about, of how the British, in entering trade with the Chinese, were buying all of their tea from China, and China was buying nothing from the British. The British had nothing the Chinese wanted. <laughs> and yet the British wanted that tea. They were hooked on a tea habit. And the Chinese demanded only silver and gold from the British. And that meant over time that the British balance of payments became unbalanced because our silver and gold was flowing into China, but nothing, no earnings were coming back from the Chinese, and they were facing a dilemma. They recognized that this situation could not continue, or else they could not maintain their social institutions, and they could not maintain social order in their society, and that their government could not maintain legitimacy, and the people at some point would rise up against it and revolt and refuse to follow its dictates and refuse to pledge allegiance to it and destroy it. Because this is what happens to nations when they have negative flows of wealth. Because it takes wealth to maintain order. It takes wealth to maintain institutions. It takes wealth to maintain employment system. It takes wealth to create jobs. It takes wealth to educate children and so forth. And when that wealth is flowing out into the hands of other people, these institutions collapse. 
the discipline of the people collapse. The obedience and the habits of obedience collapse and chaos begins to reign. And the only way governments can maintain power then under those circumstances is often to use martial law and strong martial means of maintaining population control. And that has serious limitations. And the British then recognized that we had to change the situation or else our very society will be destroyed. And what did they do then? They hooked the Chinese into an opium habit and started and addicted the Chinese and then demanded of the Chinese once they got hooked, now you pay us for your opium in silver and gold. And that habit got to such a level that the balance was reversed and the flow went out of China to England. And when the Chinese tried to stop it, the English government, the old pusher that it is, yes, a government based on drugs. The queen, the greatest drug pusher the world has ever known, went in like any gangster on these streets out here to protect their monopoly to sell drugs to the Chinese and engaged in two wars to maintain the drug market that they had established. And yet you try to sit here and listen to these jokers with their moral pieties <laughs> trying to talk up to us. Nation built upon the selling of drugs and the government coming in defense of the selling of drugs. But my point here is, of course, what happens when you get trade imbalances. And the Chinese recognize, if we don't stop this stuff, our wealth is going to flow out to such a degree until we then will suffer social collapse. Now, when you looked in at the African-American communities, surrounded by non-African communities, plagued by economic parasites, coming into its midst and taking its wealth and earnings right out, exploited by white and non-white alike, who rob it of its wealth and rob it of its resources, and who even in this stupidity tries to say the answer to this is to increase the number of us with skills and education, only to have those with increased skills and education also what? Shipped out so that they can solve other people's problems and spend their earnings in other people's markets and therefore can't return neither their skills nor their wealth back to the original community. So then what do you have? A community, an African nation with a tremendous trade deficit, with a tremendous trade imbalance, with a tremendous outflow of material resources and capital and brains and an increasing concentration then of people who are bereft of skills and resources and the like. Violence and social disorganization, family and institutional disorganization becomes inevitable under those circumstances. Am I getting across to you? Because I don't want to hear you talking to me when I tell you that you've got to throw these Koreans out of this community and you've got to throw these Arabs out of this community and you've got to throw all the rest of these jokers out of this community, come talk to me about some racial harmony and love and reverse racism and hiding under Islam and some Christian ideology because you must recognize the hard cold fact is you cannot educate your children you cannot train them in the way they should go. You cannot give them appropriate recreational centers and other things they need without material wealth. And you can't do it by handing it over to other people. And it is not the result of hard feelings or racial hatred against any other people. It is not reverse racism. It is a matter of survival and protecting your own.
I do not want to hear any pompous discussions about values. A pompous discussion about how parents should teach their children values. Anybody who's lived in the ghettos as long as I have knows that you can teach values day in and day out and still lose your children. Because we live in a world and in a context where we are not the only one that raise our children. We're not the only ones that, that uh, influence our children. The middle class isn't better at raising children and it isn't better at, at projecting values. It is only better at buying neighborhoods. Because when you buy your house, you buy your neighborhood. You buy your school. You buy a set of neighbor, neighbors. And you buy a social and political context. That is not just the buying of a house. You buy a totality. And you buy a totality that supports your values. Values are, are little or no account when they are not reinforced by a social system and rewarded by concrete uh, outcomes. How long can one hold on to a value when one is starved with, with holding on to that value? When one is punished and rejected, even when one demonstrates that one has held on to that value? When then we demand that our children exhibit certain values, then we should be in the position to reward their exhibition of those values, or else we will look as hypocrites and fools, and we will give them empty and pious sayings that in the long run work against their interests and not for their interests. Half, or at least 400 billion, of all entitlements went to households with incomes over $30,000. You hear what I'm saying? $400 billion went to people who earned over $30,000. You talk about your, pri your individual pride and your individual drive and how you got your little house as a result of individual drive, even though you ran down to the Federal Housing Authority to back your mortgage and to back your damn payments. Even though you have engaged the federal government to insure your mortgages. And you're going to talk about how independent you were in getting your house. How can the poor then go to the federal government and get it to insure their rent? And pay out rent and other costs now, now, you got a government behind you even when you think you're buying that house all by yourself. Even when you think you've scraped and saved and put that down payment on it. When you sit up there and deduct those credits, who do you think stands in and pays the tax? You don't pay. When you write so proudly the deductions that you deserve as a homeowner. When those of us who pay rent and other things cannot make the same claims. Do you think that you are being independent? No, you are not. You are feeding from the federal trough, and you are feeding at the rate of billions from the federal trough. And therefore, those one half of, of all of those entitlements, $400 billion, went to households, 30000 and above, one quarter or at least $200 billion, approaching almost the whole spend earning power of black people, went to households with incomes over $50,000. Who is on welfare? Who is dependent? You understand? That's why when you hear them on TV talking about this federal deficit, they'll just mention the word entitlement. Well, hey, we've got to get rid of these entitlement programs. And, of course, people read into them, oh, they're talking about those welfare people. <laughs> you see, they're talking about those uh, Section 8 folk or something like that. And, and you ask yourself, why do they never discuss what they mean by entitlements? 
And why is it that despite the tremendous deficit that this country is facing, a deficit that threatens its very viability, those men in the U.S. Senate and House cannot pass bills to straighten that deficit up. They are so gutless and afraid to pass bills and come to terms with a deficit that is threatening the very uh, social foundations of this nation that they are trying to create a constitutional amendment so that they would be forced to balance the budget against their will because they know that they can never develop the will to do it. That's the way New York State does it. You know, it's just written in the Constitution. You've got to balance it, period. There's no way around it. Because the federal government doesn't have this, you see. And so that is what the Senate is saying, those people in the Senate are saying, we can't get the guts, despite the threat, to see that this doggone deficit is taken care of. Why can't they get the guts? Is it that they're afraid of welfare people? Are they afraid of welfare rights? Mm -mm. They're afraid of the main welfare people, those suburbanites that they're talking about, those $50,000 a year people, those $100,000 a year people who are now getting billions of dollars from the federal trough. That's why they can't pass it, because those are the people with the lobbies. Those are the people who, with the organizations. Those are the people with the power. Those are the people who can diselect folk. And so consequently then, they are almost ready to see this country collapse on itself. But you know in the end who's going to be blamed for it because they keep just using the word entitlement. And the mass population will read entitlement as people on welfare. We're going to have then an attack, a genocidal attack on black folk. What are the long-term preconditions then that set up the L.A. riot besides the ones I mentioned? An interesting piece in the, in the um, Village Voice called Herbicide by Daniel Lazar points some of them out. Subsidized private housing. You must know, you see, that the government, you notice whenever the government tries to read what they call leading economic indicators as to whether the economy are, is, is moving up or whether the recovery is over, what is the first thing they look at? Housing. Housing and housing starts. Because if you, you stop for a minute, you recognize the building of houses is attached to so many other industries. You understand? When you, buy, when you buy a house, you're buying furniture, you're buying rugs, you're buying carpenters, plumbers, you're feeding the brick industry, you're filling the pipe industry, you're feeding the tile-making industry, you, the insurance people, the, you know, there are tons of people that ride on housing. And that's why the government looks at it as a crucial factor in indicating recovery or not. And consequently, the government is not going to take a hands-off approach to housing and to the buying and purchasing of housing and the building of housing. No, by no means, because the housing and the building of housing is crucial to the economic system. So consequently, it will create perks and other kinds of things to try to generate the increased development of housing and building of housing and buying of housing. And therefore, even though the middle class may deceive itself into thinking it's due to its hard work and its values that it gets these houses, these houses are subsidized, subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer, by the poor, and by all the citizens in this country. But you see, again, the rich calls their, call their welfare subsidies, tax credits, and all these other names, and they call ours welfare. Each year, the federal government doles out an estimated $70 billion or more in annual tax subsidies to bolster an ostensibly private suburban home market. By comparison, the federal government allocated just $1.8 billion last year for public housing and $150 million for 
uh, uh, subsidizing programs for the homeless. 150 million compared to what? To billions, 70 billions subsidizing suburban housing. 150 million for the homeless, 1.8 billion for public housing. The racist backlash engendered by the black migration wave of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s vastly accelerated a process already underway, that is, urban decline. The whites were getting out. And that's what has happened. Whites have just left the cities, mainly to get away from blacks. But this was not done innocently. This was assisted by the government itself. This was assisted by a government that took your savings in these banks, the savings that they denied to you, called redlining, a government that, a, 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 a situation that we saw last week, that the higher the earnings of black people, the greater the rejection rate for loans, okay? A system that takes the billions of dollars earned by black folk, and I haven't even talked about created by black folk. What do we say? If Tyson earns 20, billion, 20 million, he must be generating what? 200 million. Where are, the, where are the other 80, 180 million going? Why aren't black people getting that? If Michael Jackson earns so many millions of dollars, then he must be creating what? A billion. Where, where's, where's the other part of the billion going? Why aren't black people getting this other part? We, if we earn over 300 billions of dollars, then we must be generating well over a trillion or more dollars. Where is that money going? And how is that money used? In what banks is it being deposited? But we want to look at that. Let's look at what we put in and recognize that the very money we put into these banks across this country are the very monies that were loaned out to pave the roads to suburbia. The very monies that were loaned out to move factories out of this nation and to other segments of this population so that these companies would not have to deal with unionized labor and so forth. In other words, the oppressed, to a great extent, finance their own oppression. Drugs we don't have to talk about. Deindustrialization. America has been on a retreat from manufacturing since the 1970s with devastating consequences. Between 1958 and 1975, uh, New York City lost nearly 50% of its manufacturing job base. And then you want to compare black children and black people with the other generation. When the other generation when they dropped out of school in the eighth grade or sixth grade, could walk into a plant, could walk into some kind of industry and get a decent paying job. And now that, that, that net has been swept completely out from under black people. Nearly 50% of manufacturing jobs went out between 58 and 75. Under the Koch administration, they lost an additional 37%. The thing about this deindustrialization is that it is deliberate. It was not accidental. It was deliberately and consciously planned. You had a bunch of foolish people who thought that all this country needed to do was to sell information and to process information, to ship its factories out to other places and, 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 and work with information only, and, there, and thought that Wall Street and that gambling joint down there would be the basis for maintaining the economy of New York City. Foolishness, pure foolishness. A nation that literally does not tax industries and so forth owned by its own citizens once they move off the border of America. That literally then encourages and subsidizes the actual movement of industry out of the country. And in turn, has a very liberal tax policy for foreign countries that own businesses in America. And that's why the Japanese call them children. Yeah, boys, foolish. White males 
I see by them is it's just a bunch of foolish little boys. These people will be eaten alive by the Asians because they're so caught up in their racism and arrogance, they cannot see what is going on. We'll sum it up here then by saying then that there were many preconditions prior to the LA disturbances and other disturbances. And these were the history of the act that we saw occur there. On top, though, of these conditions, it's what I call the state of mind. You know, whites, as I've indicated, think that they are nonviolent people. They will measure their levels of physical violence with black levels of physical violence. And as I said, they run a statistical game. And they'll often get away with it because people associate violence with physical interaction. You see, so we talk about violence and automatically we think of murder, killing, you know, physical attacks and assault and so forth. But you see, when you're in power, there's another form of violence available to you. And when you're in power, you can call it by other names because power gives you the right also to define. And the power to define manipulates people's consciousness and blinds them to reality. And therefore, the ruling classes can appear to be even effeminate, nonviolent types. Wouldn't hurt a fly but are yet the most violent people around. Because we cannot discount psychic violence. The violence against a person's mind. The violence against a person's perception of who he or she is. The violence that occurs from depriving a person of wholesome and healthy experiences that motivate and that provide the foundations for their healthy mental, social development as persons. Violence that motivates self-hatred. Violence that motivates alienation from the self and from the other. Violence that destroys initiative, that destroys persistence, that destroys the capacity of a community to organize itself socially and politically to act in its own interests. Violence that motivates many people then to engage in the self-destructive acts of drug addiction and other addictive forms of behavior. This is the most utter and the deepest violence of all. For often people can survive and respond and bounce back from physical violence. But the violence done to minds from the very first days of birth and from the very first years of life are extremely difficult to change. As a psychologist, as a person engaged in therapy, you come right up against the fact that it's usually those first two, three, four, five years that are still working in a distorted personality. Those first three, four, five years that have driven a person insane, made them neurotic and maladjusted. And sometimes it takes almost another three or four or five years to even begin to get them on the path to healthy adjustment and behavior. A type of violence that breeds violence in itself and makes it appear that violence is self-initiated. And it's the type of violence you see that whites have visited on blacks so that they can stand back and say, we are not hurting them, we are not killing them, they are doing it to themselves because they've hidden the foundational violence and that is the violence against the black consciousness and the black mind in such a way then that it expresses itself as black on black violence. This is the violence that comes, as we talked about earlier, 
from projecting black people as the major problem in the society. And this type of violence creates a sense of vulnerability and insecurity, a sense of dread, and a sense of threat. It is this kind of violence that makes us wonder as black people if we are not slated for genocide. It creates then in us a state of mind, an offended sense of justice, an offended sense of self-image, self-esteem, self-confidence, a sense of powerlessness, a sense of incompetence, a sense of the inability to influence and control our environment, a sense of not being respected, a sense of social and self-alienation. And it is then the coming together of this state of mind with the material and other conditions I've enumerated earlier. This underlying anger and this underlying frustration, this underlying and chronic sense of self dissatisfaction and dissatisfaction about the whole state of the country and of the world, that a seemingly small event in the eyesight of whites, the rendering of an obviously unjust decision serves as a spark that leads to an explosion. But they take us as fools. They think that we have not registered all of the prior injustices. They make, they, they take us to think that we have a memory that does not include those injustices, and one that says, you must stop here, and we're not going to let you go any further. We are going to end the injustices that you have been visiting upon us. These people think that they have set up a system of domination wherein they can hide their injustices, except that domination itself is an injustice. I have to say one thing here, and I sort of have stated in other forums, when I've seen our people respond to Pinnell and respond to the other injustices perpetrated by this government and by its courts, that we can march around these courthouses from now until doomsday, ultimately that is not going to change anything. While we must protest and let the system know that we object to injustice, we cannot let this be the end point of our protest, or else it will never stop. We will be protesting forever. Sometimes I'm a little disappointed by leaders who keep marching us around these courthouses and who keep talking about justice, no justice, no peace. Because there's this assumption that they can permit the white male to remain dominant in this system, that they can permit the white male to maintain his monopoly on power And at some point, in some way, he will be just. They do not see the contradiction that it is injustice itself that is the foundation of a monopoly on power. That it is injustice that makes the monopoly on power and domination what? Possible. And that you cannot leave a people in power and with a monopoly on power, unless you leave in place an unjust system. So ultimately, if you are to get justice, if we are to get justice, we must remove the white boy's ability to be unjust. Because as long as he has a monopoly on power, he must engage in injustice to maintain it. And this is the basis of my conferences on power. Some of you may have heard me at the slave theaters, theaters I laid out this thesis. We may explain and reasons why whites are what they are and why they do what they do. 
We can talk about sun people and ice people. We can talk about people protecting their genes, and these theories have validity, so I'm not attacking their essence. We can lay out all kinds of explanations. But from my point of view, the reason why white folk do what they do is because they can. It's because they have the power to do so. And all our explorations as to why they are doing it, how they came to do it, and talking about their cold, icy natures, or talking about their protection of their genes, is not going to change this fact. It is the nature of the power relationship between African American people and European American people that makes injustice possible. And therefore, if we are to end this injustice, we must end the power of these people to be unjust. And therefore, the thrust must not be asking them for justice, but breaking their arms and making their being unjust impossible. And consequently, the focus of our attention and energy then should be on the development of power and the creation of power. And instead of studying too deeply their psyches, we should study power as subject matter its development, use, and application. For power is the very essence of life. No life is possible without it. And to ignore power, to ignore its development, to ignore its appropriate use, is to ignore life itself and ultimately invite death and destruction. We live in a system here where black people have been made to think that power is a dirty word and that to discuss power and to talk about its cultivation is a sinful activity. Well, you must get over the propaganda that's created this attitude toward you. We will end it here then and recognize that the LA situations were types of revolutionary activities and possibly pointed to revolutionary change not all revolutionary acts or acts of revo revolt are successful in forcing policy changes, much less in overthrowing governments. Mass uprisings not aimed at revolutionary change, which have little or no ideological content, no plans for general reforms, are subject to failure. Revolts are easy targets. Such revolts, that is, revolts with ideolo without ideological foundation without ultimate plans and purposes. Such revolts are easy targets for existing power structures. The mass revolt without a social program with limited leadership capabilities. And we are a community here that somehow just expect leaders to sprout up out of the ground instead of training them and expect people to do the right thing instead of creating institutions to train and bring about the people to do the right thing and preparing them for doing the right things. Revolts generated by people who take this approach to power will produce then leadership, limited leadership, leadership with limited cap capabilities, cannot exploit its initial victories won in the first wild upsurge of hatred and resentment or whatever you call it. You cannot what? Capitalize. I saw some people rejoicing in the Crown Heights disturbances, thinking at last the millennium had arrived, that out of this would grow a revolutionary change in New York. I'm sorry I had to object because I did not see the ideological foundations that would become vehicles for that change. Victorious in the battlefield, its participants can only appeal to the ruling regime to set things right, to revert to the old just ways of doing things. And we see that again. After the riot is over, we even use the riots to plead. See, we told you we were in trouble. 
We told you you wouldn't listen to us. <laughs> Those kind of riots will not go anywhere. And hoping for more of them and talking about deferment will not take us anywhere unless they are ideologically rationalized and founded. In the circumstances of these riots or these so-called revolts without ideological foundation, without a revolutionary rationale, without revolutionary goals, and by this I mean without the intent to reverse the power relationship in the society, to remove the power from the hands of white folk and white males and place that power in the hands of black males and in the hands of black people. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about revolution. A change in power relations. But that change has to be rationalized and it's not motivated by just spontaneous reactions or reactionary behaviors by reactionary protest and then by trotting out a bunch of leaders who are going to feed on that and try to, to provoke guilt and, and this kind of stuff in the ruling establishment and try to get the ruling establishment now to minister and to undertake the hard task of rationalizing our relationship to those in power with sound ideologies and sound rationales and, and, and reorganizing our relationships one to the other. Because ultimately, power is a system. Power results from the alignment of people relative one to the other. Power then involves types of relationships people have one toward the other. Ultimately then, if we are to truly revolutionize this country and truly protect ourselves as a people, we must truly revolutionize our self-concept, our self-perception, revolutionize our history, and be committed to revolutionizing our future. Thank you very much. Hey, Dr. Amos Wilson. Okay, we are going to have a question and answer period, but let's take a little break to kind of stretch and get a little liquid refreshments and some delicious food outside. And um, there's a photo exhibit upstairs in the art gallery that's open. And um, do get your sweet roots over here. <laughs> and uh, we have some buttons and T-shirts also. See, I have someone's pen here. <laughs> no. <laughs> Black pen. Yeah. Very nice. I guess they must have uh, left it out of the room there. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Huh? <laughs> okay. All right. We ready? Okay. Could you explain to us the effects of propaganda on African American people mm -hmm. that deliberately use propaganda, you know, that helps to create the false state of consciousness that many of our people are in? That one of the tools of power that are used are propaganda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, of course, that's a, a very broad question, a very broad issue. And uh, one of the major things that I referred to earlier 
in terms of the psychic violence is, of course, uh, refers to propaganda. Propaganda relating to the concept to propagate, to propagate a particular view of the world, a particular view of reality, to try to create a particular consciousness, mainly through the manipulation of information and through the a biased interpretation of information. Propaganda, while it can and may be lies and may be untruths, can even be based on truth, but truth are uh, projected in such a way or interpreted in such a way that it in effect deceives the individual. The major force is to to control or influence the consciousness of the individual and the behavior of an individual that's favorable or compatible with the intentions of the propagandist. And certainly the experience, our experience here in America has been a situation infused with propaganda, by propaganda, the whole uh, slandering of African history and culture uh, of course, is a propaganda campaign that started from the very beginning, even prior to enslavement, that continues up to this day. The inflation of European history and culture, the inflation of uh, the European pretenses to being civilized, of course, en engage uh, propaganda. I have argued to a great extent that the European being a minority in this world maintains his power through deception, that that is the key to maintaining uh, his power, that is deceiving the people and reversing their mentality and reversing their minds. Of course, propaganda becomes even more effective when the propagandist is successful in preventing uh, contradictory information from being spread is 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 um, has the advantage of the control of media, and has the advantage of uh, being in control of information, and of being perceived as an authority, and as the validator of truth, and the final word. And all of these things we see in this country and even in the on the globe period has been have been pretty much accomplished by the European. Now, the thing that we're going to concern ourselves with in our power course, of course, is not to look at ourselves so much as the victims of propaganda. We are going to look at propaganda in terms of how we are going to use it against others how we can develop propaganda, and how we can propagate our ideologies and our perceptions as a people. How we then get our information to successfully contradict information that is creating the kind of consciousness that we are battling today. We are going to look at the propaganda instruments that are made available to us, and there are quite a few made available to us, that we are not using uh, nearly as much as we should as people. Of course, the inclusion of things like the, the changing of the so-called curriculum, the, the, uh, the establishment of the African-centered curriculum uh, is what we call good propaganda. It is what I call... Uh, psycho inoculation. If we say that to a good extent our behavior is rooted in self alienation, being separated from ourselves, not knowing ourselves, or having negative attitudes toward ourselves, as a result of another group projecting negative information, hiding information, uh, biasing information, then of course one of the obvious answers to this kind of attack is for us to have sound and solid information about ourselves, a sound and solid knowledge of a history of ourselves and the history of our enemies, and to educate ourselves and our children in terms of how propaganda works, how it is used against us, 
how the media seeks to manipulate us in these kind of things so that despite their propaganda campaigns, we can resist them successfully. Ultimately, we must reduce the authoritative stature of the white man. We must raise authorities and authority figures within our own communities so that the final words will rest within the community and not outside the community itself. We see the good use of propaganda in the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad and other groups, and we need to study them from that point of view under Marcus Garvey and people of this nature. So we have plenty of good examples of if the effective use of propaganda and how it can be used for our interests instead of against our interests. Yes, ma'am. I think I'll have to hold this. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I'd like to thank you for being so clear on on your topics. You're able to bring things to light so that we can break it down and see it and we can relate it to our lives and our everyday way thank of you. living. Thank I'd you. also like to, in the same breath, thank the African Poetry Theater for bringing you as well as other informative lecturers. Mm -hmm. My question for you is, um, the only thing that I was not too clear on was <coughs> when you mentioned that uh, if we purchase our own homes, mm -hmm. that it helps to aid the federal government. Is mm -hmm. there perhaps an alternative? Because mm -hmm. what I'm looking at is, you had also mentioned in the same token that it is good, on the other hand, to have your own homes. Mm -hmm. Because in that case, you're able to build a community and make it your own. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps you can break it down to me a little bit. What, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not advocating the not buying of homes, of course. <laughs> what I was trying to get across, the idea I was really trying to get across there was to get people to understand that when they buy homes, you know, and buy suburban homes and other things, I wanted to disabuse them of the idea that they are not getting government aid. You see what I mean? I have nothing against black folk getting money from the U.S. government <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. The problem is often when you look at the history of housing and you look at uh, the history uh, support for the buying of houses, the very federal government that has subsidized housing by other people have agreed to discriminative statutes and approaches that has prevented black people from uh, receiving these entitlements. And so more what I'm looking at here then is, uh, is that we recognize that the government is supporting to a very great degree, far more than poor people, so that we recognize that blaming poor people and seeing cutting people off welfare and those kind of things as a way of solving problems is not the problem. That if America is going to solve its problems, and I'm not really that concerned about it in, the, in this sense, that what it requires is that people look at their look in their own front yards and see to what extent they themselves are also a part of the problem and come front face to face with the fact, uh, with, the issue, with the issue as to whether they're ready to engage in self-sacrifice before they require the sacrifice of others and so forth. And that we as black people also come to get a deeper understanding of how this government manipulates uh, the housing markets so we can take advantage of it in one level, but also so that we won't be duped into self-condemnation and in condemning each other uh, because we are ignorant of how um, the government is, is used and how that white middle class especially uses the federal government. It's designed also to get some black middle class, or some with bourgeois attitudes uh, such as the Thomases, who think that they've made it in the world without U.S. government support, and who do not realize often that in a, on a whole, they probably receive more welfare than the people they, they've condemned. So then perhaps another question I might have for you is, is there perhaps an alternative that we can do in order to not only help ourselves in order to build up our communities and our own personal selves, but as well as to continue to help mm -hmm. those who are in need, aside from, you know, the regular things that you do in, in terms of just aside from donating to the church, but rather mm -hmm. come to a, a, an association such as this where you can mm -hmm. give money or just in turn give back to the, com the community, period. Is there perhaps something else that we can do mm -hmm. um, 
in terms of building our own communities collectively without the government per se. I don't, yeah. I don't really know. And I, I, I have no hesitation for using the government because as I remind people, it's our money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're paying taxes and we've given all of this free labor and all the other kind of stuff, uh, we shouldn't hesitate to to get the money. Okay. Okay. Because I know some people, you know, they want to back off. Of course, you don't want though to become prisoner to the government, and you don't want the money in such a way that the government dictates policy. And I can understand that, and that of course then implies that we become very uh, sharp at manipulating the government, and we should learn from others how the governments, if we're instance, from Ross Perot, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you manipulate it and how do you work it to your own advantage? Uh, let's look at this electoral system. How do we get our own people in and how do we then use our own people to, to, to get that government money to work for our interests as people? We must get a sound knowledge and a thorough knowledge of how this government operates and works so that we can manipulate it to our own advantage. That's, that's a number one. And then the other thing, of course, is, and this is what we'll be doing, look at how we have in the past uh, financed our entrepreneurial activities. I just did a, my second lecture on the power thing last week on our power conference coming up last week. And one of the things I looked at, a very interesting book by a person named, uh, last name but Butler, Sidney, I think, Butler, the last name is Butler, called um, Black Enterprise and Self-Help in America. Very interesting book there. Because in this book, he establishes the black entrepreneurial position uh, beginning even under slavery itself. And how all of these characteristics that we now see in other people, Koreans and Japanese and Cubans and so forth, were plain and simple and straightforward in black people as far back as 200 years ago. As a matter of fact, the only reason why we see these characteristics as unique to these people is because we don't know our own entrepreneurial history. <laughs> right. Now, the answer then to developing associations, to developing alternative uh, means, but they're in our history already. And it requires that we review those histories and review even the prior African histories and the means by which we support ourselves in businesses and create businesses and so forth are there for the taking. And I would recommend the uh, book by Butler uh, called uh, Black, Enterpri Black Entrepreneurship and Self-Help in America and uh, as a means. Then I'd recommend a second one by Ivan Light, uh, I believe it's called Immigrant Enterprises. Ivan Light, and of course if you can get the original one called uh, Ethnic Enterprises in America, then you will see in a number of uh, alternatives. Okay, once again, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I uh, recently saw you, I think, at um, the Slave Theater, and you were talking mm -hmm. about the, uh, the Black Credit Union. Yes. Can you explain the success of it, and do you have any more information about mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, at that time, the organization that I represent, the Pan-African Research and Development Foundation, is uh, seeking to establish a credit union because we believe that this, this approach is more compatible with our purposes as a people because the, the members of a credit union are its, are its owners and are its, its uh, shareholders, and they determine very directly its policies. And its lending policies to its members are far more generous and liberal, you see, than so-called banking policies. I have argued, for instance, that there's no such thing, in a sense, as a black bank, particularly as a black commercial bank, uh, because it's, it, in, in, in achieving that charter, the federal regulations and so forth are on it so stringently until uh, really you, uh, you don't, you're not free to lend your money as you see fit, 
You must maintain heavy cash reserves. You must apply uh, means tests that really should be applied to people from a very mature economy and so forth so that you, you have an institution there that really cannot do very much at all in advancing the economic development of black people by the very structure of that institution. The, the money literally, even though you put your money in the bank, it literally li really comes under the control of another people. And they tell you when and under what circumstances you can lend it, and uh, they're, they're, they're on you at all times. Uh, and evidence of that, of course, is when you look at the Freedom National Bank, it's somewhat ironic that almost for every year it remained on that street, the number of Korean businesses grew. <laughs> and and uh, you have to question, you know, how much did that bank really contribute to the development of black businesses? And it had a lot to do with the structure. The uh, credit unions, which can offer the same uh, kind of services, the ATM services, the car loan services, and the other kind of services you see as banks, uh, have a much greater latitude in terms of lending policies and other kind of policies uh, that I think are very compatible to our people rather than uh, the bank. And we are developing that. We are continue to develop one in the fall and, of course, encourage people to investigate uh, credit unions and, and develop them among themselves uh, in their particular organization. We do have the literature and we do have the experts that if you're interested in developing one in your area with your group, we can recommend to you. And all you have to do is get in touch with us, and uh, we'd be happy to put you in touch with the person who can give you all of the details and the methods by which you establish them. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you answered the question before when you were speaking to uh, the young lady, but uh, I'm a small business owner, and uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering how would you go about approaching a twofold individuals who um, patronize, uh, you know, they come to your store, uh, who maybe don't have the consciousness to recognize that they should uh, look to support mm -hmm. their own businesses as opposed to the Arab store across the street and whatever stores in the area. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, other black businesses in the area, uh, how does one go about maybe putting together some type of organization or some type of collective mm -hmm. so that this can be uh, maybe broadcasted or, or put to the people in a more direct fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that first one, of course, is very tough. And it's one <laughs> that we are, we are trying to work through very much. And of course, having attempted retail and you know business, and of course, I'm still a business person <laughs> at this very point. Uh, I can understand the kind of issue that you went through uh, <clears throat> with the retail outlet I had on 125th. Of course, I try to approach this uh, matter that you're talking about by creating an appropriate atmosphere in the, in the business itself, by projecting a very positive cultural image and, of course, projecting the kind of interpersonal relations such that uh, the stereotypes and expectations and attitudes that people would bring into the business would be slowly broken down. Uh, because I recognize often customers really come in sort of wanting, they come in with ambivalence, and they sometimes will come in uh, wanting to see if you can give them a reason not to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, we have customers who often are invested in your failure, you see. And these are the, these are the psychological realities we have to face, too, in the sense that... Uh, They've often made excuses for their own lack of ent entrepreneurial drive. Uh, they've come to believe the propaganda that we are not business person, that a black person just cannot succeed. And in a sense, your very being in business and succeeding contradicts their notions and their rationales. And in a sense, in a paradoxical sort of way, they feel validated when you do fail. And uh, so they will represent a challenge to you. And this is why, of course, you're being aware of this means, of course, a high degree of diplomacy and a high degree of patience 
with these individuals and 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 but not preaching you see uh sometimes it'll take one two years before these people are finally broken down and and but sooner or later i find i wait for people to ask the questions our people are going to stand back and look and see if you make it for one or two years and interestingly enough you, you you're dangling on the string because they wait to see if you can do it <laughs> and, but you have to hang in there and often then you'll find they'll, they'll come and ask when and that's your opening how you see and at that point you can introduce your philosophy and your ideology of success and so forth you see your very success establishes your authority to speak on the issue and sooner or later as you get to know people and interact with people who will invite you to groups and other kind of things at that point you carry the authority of a successful uh, person and you you listen to and you begin to slowly change the consciousness of, uh, of people around you the organizing of, of other people is another difficult one too because we have absorbed American individualism so deeply and it is still something that you have to take very slowly and agonizingly with and and not get upset when people backslide and and play around you it's a situation like any good salesperson which you have to be as a business person you can to keep cultivating them and it may take some time to cultivate them subtly and uh, gently but of course again your business success the atmosphere and the nature of your business the word of mouth that flows from that business uh, often can be used to stimulate others to begin to uh, sort of move in your direction or makes them more responsive to your your uh, approaches I think it's very important though that you have gone a distance in developing plans and mechanisms and do the groundwork and the spade work because my experience is when you approach our people with vague ideas and kind of vague concept of what we ought to do and, and then as generous as it may sound where you want to sit down and all work out the means together you lose people very rapidly <laughs> my approach is to pretty much have that your program laid out and try to recruit people to the program and have that program set up in such a way that its benefits are fairly obvious and they occur pretty rapidly so that the leave the association uh, is a loss at some cost to them uh, rather than just sort of and unfortunately you're going to have to do a lot of the hard work yourself at the beginning because as soon as you start making assignments and committees you know <laughs> people <laughs> disappear so you know <laughs> and don't be afraid to take the one or two years it might you know take you to really set that thing up but people like to join on what they see as has a good possibility of success and so try to sell them a package that convinces them that it, it has a good chance of success Thank you. Mm -hmm. sure <clears throat> you've written a lot about IQ testing mm -hmm. what age does that first test take place in like do you have to is that a mandatory thing uh, depending on the institution you're dealing with like the public uh, no, the IQ is not a mandatory thing in public schools, even though it's mandatory in some private schools as a part, depending on the level of exclusivity, as a part of their admissions policy, you see. But otherwise, um, it's not really the gatekeeping, you know, instrument it used to be where uh, the student would have to to uh, pass on this thing except but it becomes a value too because sometimes it's used by school psychologists or others to try to evaluate students who may have problems sometimes it's used by administrations uh, uh, students or some form of IQ test because it may be hidden in other forms as a basis for tracking and putting students in different uh, class tracks you know fast slow this and that. So it's a test just to avoid those tests? Uh, you can avoid them particularly if they are, are being used uh, incorrectly and they're being used as a means um, 
they're being used unfairly. And mean? at this point, though, I don't think you would need to really worry about them in the sense of their misuse, because in the normal uh, run of things, you really don't run into them that way. I emphasize the IQ test as a very rough measure of uh, intellectual growth. It is not, it does not define intelligence such as pure innate intelligence, but more as an indicator of learning experiences that an individual has had. Uh, obviously the tests are culturally biased. However, because they're culturally biased, I don't necessarily condemn them because of my belief that we as African people can pass these intelligence so-called IQ tests as well as and better than whites and that we can pass them in, as a way of learning what they need to know and a way of learning what we need to know so that we can finally defeat them. I like the way the Japanese approach to it has been in the sense they have not had to necessarily throw away their culture while maintaining their culture they have beaten the Europeans at their own test. And what I'm saying is that we can be African-centered, African-based and beat these people even at that test. We don't have to be afraid of them using the test and we don't have to avoid the test. In fact, we tell them to bring it on and whip them with it. So what I'm trying to say essentially in writing my book is raise your children, match their growth and development with appropriate experience. You won't have to worry about an IQ test. You know what I'm saying? They will pass those tests and beat the white kids at those tests and therefore they can't be used against you in a, in, in a negative sort of way. So center your life around organizing and building up and maintaining the genius of your children. From that point on, the test is no problem. In fact, it can become a positive instrument for you. Sure. <clears throat> Hotel, brother Wilson. Hotel. I uh, was watching the news and whatnot, and I've noticed that uh, the, the the violence that occurred with the Hasidic Jews and the African American community community last summer, and uh, a lot of violence that started off throughout a number of American cities when the Rodney King mm -hmm. verdict came through. And and I was thinking about what you said about how they could the European could stop this. And I was wondering would it at all be possible for the European to create certain conditions in a number of African communities in America that would incite such violent mm -hmm. reactions of that magnitude and then declare martial law mm -hmm. to uh to squash that and then their rationale for declaring martial law is the violence that transpired. Mm -hmm. And then just, you know, commit sure. genocide with the pistols. And I was wondering, uh, how could that strategy be uh, prevented? Mm -hmm. Or how could we inoculate ourselves against some type of strategy like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, of course, when I talked about earlier about um, plans, ideological rationales and so forth, all of this is implied, you see. Uh, the thing that I emphasize a good deal when I'm trying to get across to our people of trying to push a revolutionary program and deal with counter-revolution is, of course, the always the asking of the what if question, you know, and, and developing as many contingencies and fallbacks as possible to think the unthinkable, you see and prepare for those possibilities. And no matter how far-fetched it may seem to always think them through and try to set up a program uh, in reference to them, certainly that is a possibility. 
And of course, this kind of thing has been used in some instances before in terms of what we call the agent provocateur, where uh, a person is planted within a group and their purpose is to deliberately provoke that group into some kind of action so that the group can be arrested or, or uh, crushed by the police. And of course, while I cannot give those de cannot give any great details about this, considering this as a, a strong possibility within any group that you're a part of, particularly if you are in a, a revolutionary kind of group, of course, then should motivate you to to try to establish the kind of internal security, the kind of internal organization to limit damage should this kind of agent be present in the uh, group itself to of course to to try as much as possible to know the people that you have in your organization and uh, use various other tactics that you may have to research in that's in the literature about guarding oneself against agents placed uh, within groups. The possibility, and of course this is implied in black on black, that the criminalization of the black community to a good extent is in part a rationale to set up a prior move, uh, to set up a later movement against that black community. You, this means too, in addition to trying to screen the people who join you, and trying in some instances to resist to uh, reduce the amount of contact between the members of the organization. So in a way, if one cell ever gets caught, it doesn't destroy the whole unit. In addition to this, of course, it means strong training and strong indoctrination. And the kind of indoctrination that tests the metal of people and demand, you know, tests their loyalty, and it requires discipline. And it requires leaders who can maintain discipline within their group and who can establish some kind of discipline and control of communities and neighborhoods. It requires the kind of coalitions, you see, that don't let neighborhoods and communities and the kind of relationships that don't let neighborhoods and communities get out of control simply because there's something that's strong there. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the study of power. And it's this kind of study that we are going to engage in in the fall to deal with just those kind of questions so that we will not be reactionary, but we will be proactive as a people. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I appreciate the uh, African Post to bring you, Dr. Wilson, to our Thank you. Uh, neighborhood. Uh, my question is, um, um, how we uh, turn uh, modern day technology like in computers and uh, video mm -hmm. to our advantage, mm -hmm. uh, the education. Um, one recent uh, example is that uh, Sister Soldier um, slavery back in effect. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very um, mm -hmm. positive example of it, how uh, technology can be used. Yeah. Uh, for us, instead of against us, like mm -hmm. the TV set being used against us every day. The, uh, I remember, and I use the example sometimes of the episode I saw in uh, the C TV series Kung Fu, you know, and I talk about uh, that scene where he was facing a man who had two pistols, two bandoleros, two knives, two rifles, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff. And of course, he was somewhat, he was unarmed as usual. And he made the statement, your strength is your weakness, you see. With all of that, that stuff is going to really be the cause of your problem. You got too much of it. And by the time you try to deal with it, you're going to be done in. And when we, in, in, in this, it's, we're in a similar situation, you see with this country and with the technology in this country, you see. The, its very strength is also its Achilles heel, its very weakness. And we have to look at it from that point of view. How can it be used against it? And the very fact that that is a delicate network that's, as you have seen, easily sabotaged, where the society becomes dependent upon it, and in a way, while it adds speed and efficiency, it is also delicately balanced, you see. 
And of course, it makes it vulnerable in many ways. But on the other level, I had uh, a mailing or a mail order book, a mailing list book that listed the that had available to it a list for something like six million black families. That means that through the purchase of that list, you could have direct access to these families. You know what I mean? And now, and of course, that's the weakness, isn't it? They're selling lists. We take, we take those lists. The Republican Party was very effective. One of the reasons why it's been effective, very effective, is because it has this guy named Vigory, who, whose major power is the, the mailing out of letters of getting that mailing list and sending those letters to millions of people overnight. And this is a technology then that we have not used. That means that we have a very direct route until I guess they close the post office. <laughs> but uh, a very direct route of what? Of communicating with families that can go around TV and other kind of thing, send literature, can, can start movements, and even hide the leaders of the movement behind very interesting information. Of course, they have distribution points for the videotapes, audio tapes, and all of the other kinds of things that we that this technology makes possible for us. That computer, of course, can list all of those names and what? Print them out on the letters, put the letters out, run through a machine that folds them, stamps them, the whole thing, and you can send them out. In other words, there's a technology available to us that is of enormous power. One of the things that I will discuss in the Power Series, you see, is for us to look at what I call the tremendous resources we have available to us as African people in this country, the tremendous databases that just are uh, lying in wait for us to use. People like yourself with knowledge of computers, with knowledge of, of information storage, retrieval, and so forth, then become part of associations and organization, computer network uh, systems, electronic mail systems, so that uh, any kind of information that needs to be spread across this country can be spread across it by any number of means rapidly an organization set up. If you combine this rapid communication with people who have been appropriately trained, you see, and, and are, are located across the nation, so and have similar values, perspectives, and ideas, then, you know, we're not going to talk too much about it, but, you know, you have, you have bases, you have foundations, and uh, we just have to study the technology and we have to make up our mind that we're going to use it for us. Now, I had one point that is, uh, mm -hmm. even while we speak, uh, they are trying to pass laws to prevent that very same thing. Of course. And the beautiful part about it is we know they're doing it. <laughs> right? You see, I often tell our people, you know, when we start talking about these things, well, if you do that, they, they're going to do this. So, well, that gives you an advantage. You know what they're going to do. You see, and this is the advantage any soldier wants, is to anticipate the reaction of his enemy. And that means, and this is why another part of training for power is strategic thinking. And you heard of feints and fakes and all kind of moves, right? <laughs> Since we know what kind of reaction they're going to tend to have, then of course what we do, we, we, we strategize and we use ingenious methods and means to get around them. And we can and since we know we can anticipate. And that gives us the possibility of working alternative means and routes. But then when we talk about power, we're talking about power ultimately that must in itself influence the lawmaking process in this country. So when we're talking about power, we're not just talking about neighborhood you know, mom pop store kind of power. We are talking about a power that goes directly into the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives and influences and blocks the kind of legislation that works against our interests. That has to be developed as well. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I must ask for my pin back. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. I was calling for you a while ago. Right. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, a number of years ago, you mm -hmm. lectured at First World. How, and, how you doing? It's oh, been good, a while. Good. <laughs> and just prior to your lecturing, they showed the film Cradle of Civilization. Yes, right. Yes, now, I recall. Of course, we were all impressed with the, the, the comparisons between the African and European mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Number one, could you go over for those who might not be familiar with that mm -hmm. briefly? It, mm -hmm. You don't have time. Sure. Of how the differences between the development of the African child and the European child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And number two, could you give us, in your opinion, the long-term implications of developing a generation of African children mm -hmm. who grow up in peace and security and harmony, and the t type of leadership role they will play take? Peace, security, and harmony with whites. Uh, no, but no, for, for the future of African people. Mm -hmm. Their role in the future of African people. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I probably misunderstood you. You say who grow up in peace, security, and Well, in other words, if we, can cre if we create the conditions for them to grow up mm -hmm. in peace and security, okay. what type of role will they play? Okay, I understand. All right, then. Uh, in the current book, um, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children, uh, we add some more information that was present in the developmental psychology of the black child. And the thing that we recognize and that has been recognized is the fact that our children grow at, and develop at a much more rapid rate or significantly more rapid rate than uh, do white children. Of course, the thing that we have to recognize is that this is premised on the fact that our peoples and the bodies of our people have been developed to adapt to particular climatic and other kinds of conditions. And it's a little surprising sometimes that we kind of expected them to duplicate other ethnic groups. I, I think it's because we found that comforting. But when we look at this child, we find it doing things on the very first and second days of life that it will take the European child a month and a month and a half to do. We find it doing, and we're, and we're not only talking about so-called motor behavior, we're speaking of psychomotor behavior. Behavior guided by psychological intentions and psychological purpose. So they are physically developing more rapidly. They're gonna walk much earlier, they talk earlier. They're going to uh, get a sense of self-awareness earlier. Their social relations with, with uh, their caretakers and others develops at an earlier rate. They, they are born intellectually in advance of, of these children. The, uh, and what makes this very powerful is the fact that we know babies and, and our learning machines and the learning takes place in the womb itself. And that these children at their advanced development then, that's why I was uh, emphasizing earlier, that if we match their growth and development, we can maintain that advancement that they have. We, uh, I do a long list of childhood capabilities in awakening the uh, the, the natural genius of black children are just what babies are capable of doing. And this is basically research with so-called white children. And when we extrapolate in then what uh, the advanced development of black children, you're talking about children who get a sense of competence in the very first days and weeks of their lives. They get a, a, a sense of intentionality in the sense that by arranging uh, mobiles over their their uh, cribs and and placing them in a position where they can actually influence them in a definite sort of way. They can get a sense of intentionality, a good sense of um, cause and effect. Um, uh, uh, even they are able to categorize and to somewhat sense, uh, and to some extent conceptualize. We found that their memory is far longer than we thought in the past. All of these things are available. You see, the major thing that has uh, worked against our children is, is us as adults not having faith in their capacity and believing European propaganda about them. So um, 
the thing that costs our children, of course, is our lack of knowledge of their unique developmental psychology, which means the knowledge of ourselves as a people, ultimately. The other thing is our not having an intentional program that says we are going to train them for power and train them to end white domination because it's very important to have an intentionality you see mm -hmm. and 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 then to express that intentionality through relationship with children and through education because it is intentionality that really determines the quality of learning that serves as a motivational base for learning that term determines the nature of human relations and all of these things so it's very important that our parents not only get a knowledge of these children and their their uh, stages of development, but that we have real political economic intentions for them and, uh, and apply those through our interactions with the children. This intentionality goes into your next uh, issue there, you see. And that is answering the question we, we raised earlier. What kind of problems do we have and what kind of children do we need to solve those problems? And what kind of experiences should they be exposed to, you see? And then defining the content of the curriculum and the type of teaching method, the time systems and the other systems in line with creating these kinds of uh, individuals, persons, and group organizations. Providing them with a secure environment and an orderly environment so that learning can take place and so that they can have models for maintaining self-discipline and self-control becomes of key importance there. Providing them with uh, a sound knowledge of what their task is and what the future demands of their world will be on them and what kind of skills and social relationships they must develop in order to have to to uh, comfortably deal with those demands training them in cooperation skills training them morally so that they can have a loyalty one to the other and things like this then will prepare them both generally and specifically in a way that they can truly take power in the future world. With the sizes of our populations as African people and with the kind of wealth that we have naturally and so forth, we then really should have no fear or shame in terms of seeing the wielding of real power as one of our major goals and being one of the wealthiest and most powerful people on this goal as being, being one of our goals. Yeah, I just mm. that, um, that if, if we can't, that probably has to come from, from the parents, that in silly that vision that the children can take power or entitled to take power. Uh, yeah, to a degree, even though it's also going to have to be supported by and come from other institutions as well. Um, I'm a little hesitant about the parents, not that I'd like the confidence in parents but of course you know some of our parents often being young and some having to deal with their own uh, unpleasant experiences and other kinds of things in life uh, sometimes it's difficult to for them to get the energy and the concentration and the other kind of things to really focus on the children and so consequently it means that we have to support and develop institutions uh, extra parental institutions that really embark on the training of parents and children. And of course, this is very much in line with our African tradition, anyway, to begin with. If we again, when we look at the concept, say, of manhood training, an African tradition that really did not necessitate the chronic presence of a father in the home. In fact, it did not make the training of the male child a responsibility of the biological father to begin with, you see. 
it made the training of males a responsibility of the males in the community itself, you see. And you can see the advantage of that kind of system uh, in this kind of situation here, very much so, which is one of the reasons why we are pushing the schools for the black males, we're pushing the manhood training, we are now trying to organize those conscious males uh, in to form institutions and organizations so that uh, the responsibility for training our young men and of course similar organization among women can become a community responsibility. A part of that though too will be as we train the children we will train the parents and we will train the children to be parents you see. So in the future as we train them we can then rely on the parents more heavily to create the kind of children that we, we want and need. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Wilson. Good evening. Dr. Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, I think, two questions. I want to touch on those, mm -hmm. I want you to touch on those topics. One, uh, many of us may be old enough to remember some of the Walt Disney movies. Mm -hmm. Remember the ones where they were, you know, they were doing all kinds of experiments and they dealt with the one where they had the monkey and they were dealing with the sleep teaching technique mm -hmm. where they, they had the uh, headphones on oh, the Oh, this monkey. was a movie, not right, a cartoon. This was a movie. Okay, right, no, this I, was I a movie. They used to have these crazy movies. I don't on. see Walt Disney's um, movies, but go ahead. Right, but now yeah. in this one they had the monkey mm -hmm. and they were trying to teach the monkey to do certain things. Mm -hmm. So one of this, this this kid, this young young guy had developed a sleep teaching technique where mm -hmm. he had a tape recorder, he had headphones, and right. when the monkey went to sleep mm -hmm. at night he would play whatever it is, the information that he wanted the monkey to deal with. Right. And so in the morning he would, you know, this would go over and over. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if it would be considered to be subliminal because you wouldn't mm -hmm. really be conscious in terms of sleep. Mm -hmm. But at the same time the information would be entering into the subconscious. Right. Right, while you were sleeping. So the monkey mm -hmm. would get up and they would test the monkey on the information mm -hmm. and the monkey will have assimilated this information. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to maybe to speak on the importance of maybe us in our homes, mm -hmm. right, applying some measure of subliminal seduction with mm -hmm. our children because sometimes the only time we have control over certain certain aspects of the environment, even within our home, mm -hmm. is at the time when everybody sleep. Right? Okay. <laughs> another time. <laughs> right? Okay. And um, another thing, another thing also is um, the idea of, let's say, for example, for we as a people, we have not been controlling our economics, mm -hmm. yet we've been generating it. That right. means that somebody else has been controlling it. Mm -hmm. That means that someone has written into their budget mm -hmm. and into their activities and expenditures uh, counting our money also. Yes. So now at the point where we wake up, mm -hmm. uh, just before we wake up, this person is used to having a couple, uh, several extra billion dollars to do with as they will. Right. And since they know that we're not conscious of certain qualities in mm -hmm. terms of life, because we're not conscious of ourselves, mm -hmm. they know that they can say, all right, even though they provided this amount of money into the budget, they're not conscious of quality, so we can give them this quality and they'll be satisfied because they haven't had for such a long time and they'll mm -hmm. be glad. Mm -hmm. Now we start to wake up and uh, we say, all right, you've been dealing with our money and we, you know, we thank you for that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're ready to control our own now. So now this sizable chunk of the budget now comes from out of their control into right. our control. Right. But that sizable chunk of the budget was what allowed them to be the superpower and enjoy the luxury right. that they've been enjoying. Mm -hmm. And since they're conditioned to think at this point, not only that, that they were handling for us, they're conditioned mm -hmm. now to think that this is the norm and that they deserve right. to deal with it this way and mm -hmm. that for them not to be able to control that money, um, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This means that uh, I'm bringing around to the question of the idea of developing some type of paramilitary force in terms of uh, when we began to uh, develop our own industry, yeah. we're now taking the money out of the pockets of all the Europeans that come around and do the contracting and mm -hmm. various things in our community and take the money out. Yeah. Now, instead of 97, instead of 93 percent of the money going out, 93 mm percent -hmm. is staying in and maybe 7 percent is going out. Mm -hmm. So now they come around and say, well, hey, you guys are getting kind of big now mm -hmm. and you're encroaching into our area in terms of business and, and services. We think that because it's been this way all the time, we think that we deserve our share. After all, we were taking care of things for a while. <laughs> and I think uh, maybe we need to speak to that also. Okay. Yeah, all of those uh, issues, of course, that you raise 
will be uh, thoroughly worked through in our workshops on the uh, power thing because, of course, one of the things we will discuss is uh, the power of the black consumer dollar, turning that consumer money around and, and, and recognizing the fact that others will often respond hostily to our turning it around. I've often said, you hear people talk about uh, our reacting, say, in the Korean situation, saying, well, why don't you get your own stores and so forth? And of course, you have to remind them, of course, you're really kidding about that because, in a sense, your livelihood depends on us not owning the shops. And of course, we, but that also makes us recognize, as you so uh, put it so well, that when we do make this move, we are going to be scandalized as reverse racists and all of the other kinds of, of things. And this is why, of course, we have to develop the psychological uh, foundations and outlooks that will permit us to withstand this kind of uh, situation. And we will have to develop physical means at times, if necessary, are protecting our uh, interests. And this is not uncommon in America at all. I mean, you look at certain monopolies in this city and other places, and you again read the history of them, you will see often they were physically taken from other groups and they are physically uh, protected. It's been our hesitancy as a people to enter into this level of protection of industry and taking industry that is one of the reasons why we are in the condition uh, we are in as people. The other possibility that we will consider is the possibility of intertwining ourselves so deeply in this system and getting wrapped into it and looking at that's one reason why we want to study its economic weaknesses, you see, and study its the means by which you can get into it and see if it's possible for us to get into it in such depth and with such thoroughness that uh, these people cannot attack you other than they just tear the whole damn thing apart. <laughs> you see, so before we sort of get to the physical force of another thing, we really want to explore other possibilities. And I think there are possibilities for us to take advantage of this system uh, in such a way and in a sense, a movement against us is the time that whites are saying, well, we just want to commit Harry Carey with the whole thing and end it. And so let's look at it in, in, in that light and in the, uh, in the other light. Consumer dollars are very powerful. Uh, you, a consumer dollar can make people dependent on you. Consumption is not only a state of dependency. It can create dependency, you see. Japan has no natural resources whatsoever, okay? And in many ways, its military power, you know, may not be as strong as the United States, perhaps Russia, and maybe some other groups. But it's interesting to look at Japan's manipulation of its suppliers. By making its suppliers compete one against the other, you see, and getting a number of suppliers for the same uh, resources, they in effect control prices, you see, and make their suppliers fight each other and manipulate the market. So again, what we have to do, you see, is engage in strategic thinking and look at something that at first may appear to be a weakness of ours and see in what way it can be used as a strength and be used to manipulate people uh, as such, rather than separating ourselves so distinctly that we set ourselves up as a target, you see. Uh, it may have to happen in that way, but I suggest, though, that we really begin to explore other alternatives and, and we really come to know this system well, because I think there are ways we can work it, you see. And the other thing about the subliminal situation there, uh, I don't know, the, the research in that area is so contradictory, uh, it's just hard to, to kind of make head and the tails of it right now. 
and I don't know whether that's intentional in that uh, the powers that be don't really want people to know that this is a real power or is it is it, is the case is it really the case that people can engage in very productive subliminal learning now of course that should be one of the projects I guess I'll really offer to the National Association of Black Psychologists <laughs> you know so that we do our own research instead of reading other people's research because they hand us nothing but contradiction about this and the, the general tendency is that it's, it's not as effective as we think but what we really need to do is research it for ourselves and find out and publish this kind of information for our people so it can be used. You had a quick rejoinder, then we'll be through. Okay. You, yeah, then this, this will end it. Okay. Uh -huh. um, on the question of, of tropic, uh, propaganda, mm -hmm. earlier you mm -hmm. was asked about that. Mm -hmm. I want your views on um, the use of Spike Lee as a folk hero. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, his use of uh, Malcolm X, which I feel is towards the disarming of the freedom movement by black people, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I think you should, you perhaps should, should express your opinion on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I've become very suspicious of Spike, mm -hmm. um, and and I would admit that they had really kind of like sold him to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought the brother was uh, real. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's my understanding that Spike Lee was on Our Voices, which is a uh, TV program that comes on BET, mm -hmm. and by the sister named Bev Smith. And I understand that he told Bev Smith that it was his belief that the Nation of Islam had assassinated Malcolm X, mm -hmm. and that he intended to portray that in the movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the same time, I'm understanding that the movie was uh, basically financed by uh, a group of white Jews mm -hmm. who are, um, as I understand, the enemies of mm -hmm. um, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel that if, my, if uh, Spike does uh, go through with his promise of uh, portraying that the, uh, in the movie X that the Nation of Islam uh, assassinated Malcolm. I think that would be bad for our movement. I think mm -hmm. it would uh, be divisive. Also, uh, as a result of that, or maybe even a little before that, really, uh, with my brother Pata, who's on the sound over there mm -hmm. and doing camera, uh, had pointed out to me some time ago. Uh, we start taking a, we start taking a look at uh, Spike's movies, okay, and we f we personally feel that. His movies are problematic, mm -hmm. uh, even from um, Best Style Bob Shot, We Cut Heads, on through She's Gotta Have It, mm -hmm. uh, School Days, Do the Right Thing, More Better Blues. Mm -hmm. So uh, given that background of filmmaking, um, I don't trust Spike Lee, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so what, what Oh, Jungle Fever, right. How can I do that? So, so what do you? Ebony and I. What do you suggest? Ebony and I, you know, and and then and then um, like with uh, his uh, commercials mm -hmm. with, for Nike, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if we're gonna if we're so, gonna live together, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to play together, okay? So uh, what what do you suggest then that people <laughs> do about it? We'll turn this around. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> I don't know what to do about it, brother. <laughs> what should we do about it? I mean, I, you know, I think we just need to take a look at Spike. We need to become hip to him, and I think mm -hmm. he's, he's the major uh, media propaganda tool right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I want well, a I deep don't... psychological <laughs> well, uh, analysis on it. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I wouldn't like to disappoint you, but I'm afraid that I spend so little time thinking about Spike Lee. And, you know, uh, 
the whole thing. I, I frankly, I've seen. Let's see. I didn't see Mo Better Blues. I saw. Um, She's got to have it. Uh, Jungle Fever. School days. No. Jungle Fever. And personally, none of which impressed me that mm -hmm. much. Okay. Um, I had to be frank. I didn't see sinister motives in them, and I'm not saying it's not there. I just, it's just been my experience. Maybe because my interest <laughs> wasn't strong enough, they didn't provoke me enough to make me really go really much further than walking out of the movie and going on about my business. Mm -hmm. And so, frankly, I don't have a set of opinions or uh, attitudes really towards Spec. Uh, and I guess because of my own preoccupations, I really haven't paid too much of mind to the debates around uh, Malcolm X. Okay. And that may be also due to my own uh, state of mind in that uh, I guess I'm pretty well, my mind is pretty well made up about where I'm going and what I'm going to do uh, to the extent that it doesn't bother me too much about the Malcolm X movie. Uh, so I, I, had, I haven't felt compelled mm. to, you know, enter into some kind of proactive movement in terms of uh, what this thing is about okay. and in terms of his attitude about it. And so from that point of view, it's hard for me to really make a suggestion and to really uh, give a strong opinion or advice about how people should deal with it. Um, if it's, I hope it will, of course, give a positive image of Malcolm and, you know, it, it has a positive effect on uh, black people. I will give Spike the benefit of the doubt that he is, he's, he's trying to do that. I think Spike has enough sense to know that he just cannot come deliberately and insult black people. He may, may, may make a mistake in thinking that he's not doing so and do so, <laughs> but uh, uh, the source of his bread and butter, even though he may be financed by the other people, is still that black audience. And from the things that I've seen, I, I still will give him the benefit of that, that he will, he will try to do a favorable thing. Mm -hmm. It may not work out that way, but I'm willing to say that his intentions are not malicious, you see. Now, maybe being taken advantage of in, in, in some sort of way, certainly that can happen. But uh, at this point, because of my frank lack of knowledge and study of what Spike is about, that's about as far as I can go. The other thing that I can say, whether the Malcolm X would be uh, negative a positive is certainly nothing new in the history of black people, mm. <laughs> you know. And Malcolm X, will, if it's a negative movie, would be one among hundreds of thousands. Mm. And I have the faith in African American people that a negative Malcolm movie is not going to be a final death blow to black people's minds or to where black people are going. Mm. And I have the faith that if it is negative, we will turn it around and use it as a base for motivating our people in the right direction and use it as a base for clearing, firing our consciousness even further and turning the key to operating in this society, whether the sources that operate against us flow from people who look like us a flow from people who don't look like us is to subvert negative intentions into positive outcomes. And what I would focus on more than anything, unless you're just going to uh, blow up the movie in the can, uh, is that let's wait and see what happens. And when we judge it and see what happens, let's move into action if necessary to counter its effect and let's turn it around to our advantage whether it's positive or negative uh, at this point. I don't know what we will gain by getting into a, a big dog fight over mm -hmm. a movie we haven't seen. We don't even know what's going on in it. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see any great advantage served by getting into a big scrap, public scrap, at this point about it. We'll survive uh, Spike Lee. Okay. <laughs> you know. I so I'm willing to 
see and look and see and let the chips fall where they may. And we'll deal with it when the time comes. All right. Thank you very I much was, for your uh, attention. One mm -hmm. thing, I was asked to ask you uh, where your power classes are going to be. Uh, we will be announcing them. Of course, you'll get the flyers around here. But it looks, because I'm writing the lectures out before I, I do them, at the rate I'm writing them now, it looks like September in that range. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Scan, Dr. Amos Wilson. Okay. Um, did you get a book autograph? Got some copies still left over there. Here's the opportunity to do that. And I uh, hope to see you again. And we'll be starting our series again in the fall for lectures. at 1006 Surrey Street here in Lafayette, Louisiana, 70501. Our hotline is open 24-7, 337-593-UMOZA, 337-593-8665.